I want to start uh, with something small but serious, and that is to thank everybody for agreeing to come on this call. Um, I'm here uh, because I was originally asked by Fiona Campbell, who presumably some or all of you know a bit or quite well. Um, and I have worked with Fiona for six years. And she knows that one of the things I do is to help people prepare for interviews. So through her, I met Vicky. And Vicky and I got really enthusiastic about the idea of helping people, uh, particularly while we're on uh, in remote working, prepare for specifically job interviews. What I want to do is to give each of you just two or three really practical ideas. I'm very lucky, I love what I do for a living. And I know Vicky loves what she does. And we both agreed that actually the two of us could talk forever. And don't worry, we're not going to expose you to that. Instead, um, I will explain why I call this session making your own luck. And it's for a very simple reason, which I think will actually make sense to all of you. In your working life, whoever you are and whatever stage it is, things will go against you and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And it could be something small and it could be something big, but we're not going to worry about that today. What we're going to focus on are the things that you can do that will make your own luck. And specifically in relation to job interviews, the three things I want to say are these. Um, the first one is that you can take control of more than you think. And that's what Vicky and I are going to be showing you in the next half hour. Linked to that, the second idea I want to give you is that I think it's really helpful to think of a job interview in a much broader way, which is it is about making contacts, professional contacts, at the start of an interview, at the start of a conversation, you have no idea who you're talking to. And it could be that that person at the end of the interview a week later says, gosh, we want to give you a job. But it could be also that they say, well, actually, you're not right for this job, but I know somebody who needs somebody just like you. And I think that in your working life, it's really helpful to think that every time you meet somebody new, you have the opportunity to create a relationship which may or may not be useful further down the line. And so that's why also taking control and preparing, which is what we're going to focus on, is so important. And then the third idea is a separate one, which we will finish up with, is that having a conversation with somebody about yourself, when you do it the first time, or even frankly the 10th or 25th time, talking about yourself can be actually quite difficult. Um, I always think it's very healthy not to find it too easy to talk about yourself because we know people, don't we, who if you give them an inch, half an hour later, they're still talking about themselves. Um, but once we've highlighted a few simple principles, the big message is going to be actually practice. And the more you go for job interviews, practice meeting strangers, even um, as I will be suggesting, even getting a buddy and practice interviewing each other, like playing football, like playing tennis, um, like playing an instrument, like making puff pastry, you know, whatever, whatever is your thing, the third idea is practice. So it's taking control, it's about building up contacts and it's about practice. And what um, Vicky and I agreed was that now I've set the scene, she and I are going to have a conversation for about 10 minutes. I've got my eye on the clock. And Vicky is going to be describing 
situations she's had where people have quite simply wasted an opportunity. And then she's going to be describing situations where people really got it right. And we all agreed, or she and I agreed, that actually a few stories gets the message across much more than me, a bit like a teacher saying, here are the 10 things to get right. I will be prompting her with questions, but while you listen to the two of us, please, I want you to do two things. And that is to note down something that you think, gosh, that's interesting. Can I ask a question about that? You know, whether you want an example or you want some idea on how to do it. So what sounds interesting? And then I think the other thing, which is useful for everybody to hear, is as you hear us talking, what is something, this is the honest moment, this is where you've got to be honest with the rest of us. What have you heard us talk about that you hadn't thought about before? So those are the two things. What is it you want to know a bit more about? And what is it that is a brand new idea? Because also that's useful feedback for Vicky and me. So Vicky is now into the chair. You've got to imagine us now. We're Friday night or whenever the right time is on the telly. We're on our sofas. We're sipping a martini cocktail or something. And I'm saying, OK, Vicky, let's start because that's always the fun place. Let's hear um, about a couple of stories. Who was the person you were interviewing? And really importantly, what was it which has meant you've never forgotten it? Oh, OK, so I'm going to apologize in advance, by the way, I have two big dogs that like to bark at really inappropriate moments. So I apologize okay. to shout at them to be quiet. <laughs> I've given them both a bone, so I'm hoping that they're happy. Right. So when Sheila asked me to think up some scenarios where people have wasted the opportunity of an interview, it was interesting. I, I kind of I had to really delve in. I mean, I've, I've been interviewing for a long time now and I had to really delve into my history. Um, but there was a couple that stood out for me. Um, and yeah. when people have asked me, you know, oh, as an interviewer, you know, what's, what's kind of the worst interview you've had? For me, it's not one particular person, but I put... Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. one group for me, which stands out, which is the people who fly through an interview. So for, you know, as an interviewer, I had a lot, a half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour for an interview. I had one scenario where the interviewee within eight minutes we had done the introduction the questions and we had wrapped it up so you know when you allow 45 minutes and you're done in eight minutes that's not always a great sign and um, so and i've had that happen a couple of times where interviews have just they've gone so fast and it and you know as an interviewer we allow for nerves so you know if someone's nervous you know, can tell you know as i always say to people who come in and sit down in front of me, I go, you know, as an interviewer, I've been an interviewee, I've been in your situation, I know what it's like. So, you know, we allow for nerves, we understand that nerves can happen um, and we take that into account. But it's whenever you have someone who has been very clear that they have not prepared at all and they've come in and they've sat down and you ask the question and they give you one word answers or they give you a sentence answer and you find yourself trying to, you know, just trying to give, you know, ask a few more questions, trying to draw it out of them. Um, and that is, that's a really bad technique. You know, I always think you should go into an interview with some kind of a few stories that you can drop in and tell at any time. So I have, you know, that group, which I, I always I kind of call the, the fast interview. Yep. Um, and then the other one for me is people who don't research the company. I have mm. asked, I've worked in many different industries, not just the TV industry. And one of my favorite questions as an interviewer is, you know, why, for instance, with Stellify, it's why Stellify? Why is Stellify the company that you want to work for? What do you know about Stellify? And it amazes me the amount of times that people will sit across the table from me or sit across the screen from me. And they clearly have not researched the company. They've not researched the people. Um, mm. And not just to me, I think if you're going for an interview, that should be the first thing you do. The first thing you should do is learn the company, learn the people in the company, um, you know, find out what the company's doing currently at that time. And that works across all industries, not just TV. You know, 
you should always have questions prepared based on the company and you know their trajectory what they're doing what the inner workings of the company so for me another big issue when interviewing is definitely one it's one of the wasted opportunities is when people haven't researched the company because that that will make you stand out from other people uh, that's really helpful and um uh, could i just sort of jump in there and and highlight a couple of things that you've said which in my experience are really really important when you you know when i'm working one-on-one -on -one with somebody and they come back afterwards and say you know oh that was a good interview and i say why and they said oh because it got we, we got into a conversation mm. and i think the eight minute version is a is an extreme example of what I characterize as being um, an interview that feels like ping pong. So somebody hits you the ball and you hit, hit it back and then it just stops. And actually the point about preparation is that it is, it, you, it gives you the chance at a really basic level to answer in your own head, why, do you, why are you going for the interview? what can the company offer you and then really importantly what you can offer the company so an interview if you like is really a marriage of what the company needs and what you have to offer and any kind of research even really basic stuff um, will allow you to get that kind of conversation going so you know for example let me take something really simple like does the company is it based in one place or several places therefore are you interested or are you ready to move now something so simple like that and if you said well actually you know i've always lived in such and such a place but i you know i am at a point in my working life when i want to move that immediately shows that you're genuinely interested so that's that's one for me really important important point you made and how by research doing the research you can get that kind of conversation going the other thing that i think is really important um and again because of your background everybody on this call will understand that telling stories about what you've done is much more interesting than saying um, I like or I'm good at. And so in terms of preparation and what you want to say, um, if you're thinking about the question that the interviewer will have, why would I employ this person? If it's to do with the fact that you're very good at whatever it is, think of an example of something you've done that you're really proud of, or somebody said to you, oh, Alan, what you did there was absolutely fantastic. And by the way, we don't like boasting, but it is okay to say, when I did X, Y, Z, mm the feedback I got made me feel a million dollars. That's a really nice way of saying bullseye, you know, I'm good at that. Um, I think that, do you, want, do you want to say anything else about the negative ones or shall we go on to the positive ones? Yeah, I just have a few more kind of little pointers in terms of, you know, please, please. Like come across. Um, I would say as well, I mean, as much as you can, prepare for an interview and, and you should absolutely prepare for interviews be careful not to over prepare as well you know yeah, well, very good yeah because you very good fine line I mean I find that um a lot of interviews especially for sort of junior entry positions people tend to give me the answers they think I want to hear and I'm um, yeah. you know I can tell the difference so, I mean, especially given that, again, the TV industry, you know, I'm looking for, you know, people who are enthusiastic and passionate. And I'll ask questions like, you know, if you could work on a TV show, which TV show would it be? And 
I get a lot of people who answer with one of Stella Fi's shows. Now, I know we make amazing TV shows, <laughs> but you know, we, we don't make, the, you know, we don't make everybody's cup of tea. Um, and, you know, we do, we make incredible content, but at the same time, I don't expect everybody to wish that one of my shows is the best show ever they could work on. I mean, I love Stellify. I love the TV shows we make, but if I could work on any show, it wouldn't be one of my own. <laughs> yeah. You know, if I could work on any show at any time in history, you know, so I just think some people, they give you, you can always tell when they're giving you the answers they think you want to hear. Um, yeah. And yeah. to me, that then doesn't, your passion doesn't come across. Your enthusiasm yeah. doesn't come across because you're given almost a staged answer. So I think it's, you know, one of the, the things to be very careful of is that, you know, whenever you are answering, it's your own answers, it's your own passions, it's your own enthusiasm that comes through. So that's definitely something for me. And then, and as I'm doing right now, the other thing for me is don't talk too much. <laughs> don't, don't over talk in an interview and um, don't talk over the yeah. interviewer and don't, yeah. And, and yeah, be careful of, your content so you know if you have something that you're very passionate about yeah all means share it but condense it you know don't read the room you know if your interviewers are kind of starting to look around them and, and look down at their page you're losing them so yeah. also watching their body language because you want to make sure you're keeping them because they're interviewing a lot of different people so you've got to keep their interest and i think that would be in terms of um the negatives Sheila that would be kind of my main yeah. and and again um uh just to reinforce and by the way um I hope you can tell from our spontaneity Vicky and I did not rehearse this earlier on this morning I've not heard her say this stuff before <laughs> um this point about not over preparing and keeping spontaneity it's one of the most important points I cover with people in lots and lots of different situations. The thing about preparing is that once you know roughly what you want to do, it then allows you to use Vicky's other important point about reading the room. Mm -hmm. So when you, you come to one of your points that you want to make, even on Zoom, you can sort of tell whether somebody's interested. And indeed, this point about not over talking. If you don't let the, the other person in, or what you're saying is so prepared, what happens is the other person actually switches off. And I think that all of us have experience, including pre remote working, that people who don't know when to stop, you just the only thing to do is to switch off. Um, and I think that um, it comes back to this thing of having your mind that it should feel like an exchange of thoughts and ideas and it should feel like a conversation. And I will just add in one more point and then we'll go to the strengths. And that is, um, you can slow down or as it were, pause to think. Um, we know it from interviews that you hear on the radio or the television, for example, where there is quite a hostile person doing the interviewing. And if the pace ramps up, it gets really grumpy. And again, it just doesn't work. So in an interview, if you get a question, if you just need a moment to collect your thoughts, you might even want to say, oh, Vicky, when you said that, did you mean dot, dot, dot? So make it feel like that sort of constant exchange and don't feel that you've got to just jump in and get your message across. Um, let's move on to um, what for you are the things where you think, oh, I wish I had twice as long to talk to this person. 
That's that's the easy one. That's definitely that was the easier of the two. So for me, it is massively about passion and enthusiasm, excitement. You know, I if I'm interviewing someone or I meet someone, somebody, you know, at a lot of events before COVID, um, I would be out and you know, people would come up and start chatting to me. And you know, I find that the people who within a few minutes, their passion of, of the industry, their passion of their job, the excitement and enthusiasm, those people out in my mind and I'll leave that event or I'll leave that interview and as Sheila pointed out earlier, out earlier on you know I'll maybe think to myself oh okay well if they're not successful in this job or you know I, I have yeah. them earmarked for this job or yeah. I'm literally going to phone my head of production straight away and say I've just met somebody you need to meet so again when it comes to an interview setting for me it's hugely important to see that passion and enthusiasm which again is why I always say never underestimate the whole chit chat you know, when, as soon as you come into an interview, you know, just literally saying, oh, it's lovely to meet you, you know, oh, you know, and just starting that little bit of chit chat because your interviewers, again, we've been interviewing probably quite a few people and it's lovely just to kind of, for us to take a break as well, because, you know, as much as we might feel like ogres in the room, we're not, <laughs> we're, you know, we are normal people as well. And like I said earlier, we've been in that seat. So I always find that the people who come in and kind of strike up a bit of a conversation, and you know, just that general kind of wee bit of chit chat. Um, they tend to stand out in my mind because you you always find, I mean, again, Northern Ireland's such a small place, but you always find you've got something in common with somebody and you'll end up chatting and, and realizing, oh, I know you're such and such. Um, but it is great. Never underestimate that, that friendliness that you can bring to the room. And then through that friendliness in your questions and your answers, you can show your passion and enthusiasm and you can show your excitement and your creativity so for me, that's a huge, huge plus in an interview. The next thing as well is, um, you know, for me, again, it's when people use examples, as Sheila said earlier on, when people use examples of previous experience to answer a question. Again, you can have a few of those just earmarked for any question that, you know, no matter what, what interview you go into. And again, across lots of different industries, I get asked any of those questions, that would be the answer I would give but definitely using actual examples of a time whenever you did X or Z is great. Um, and then, as I said earlier on, you know, showing you've researched the company. Um, when it comes to the questions, every, every interview, you'll always be asked, you know, well, do you have any questions for us? Um, I would say 100% always have at least two questions. Oh, for you. Please do not let one of them be, what is the salary? That as an interviewer, as an employer, that just makes me go, oh my God. You have two questions that you've put thought into, you know, um, that can be about the company, that can be about the role, that can be about the people in the company. But, you know, I always say structure those questions because if someone gives me two brilliant questions, I'm going to remember them. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you know, those would be the groups where it's, it is, it's just about, you know, when you get to the interview stage, you've done amazingly well to get to that point. You know, you've basically, you have got 85% of the way to that job. It's that last little hurdle you've got to go over. And I think a lot of people worry that the interview, they put too much pressure on themselves, but your application has got you into the seat for the interview. And basically yeah. what we're doing in the interview is assessing you as a person and trying to just extrapolate out your, you know, your skills and your personality and and seeing you know who you really are so you've got that tiny window to let your personality shine through so for me it's vitally important as Sheila said practice that part you know don't worry about the, the answers the staged answers practice getting your personality across because that's what's going to win you the job so I think I think that kind of covers most of the the positives for me Sheila and I think um again uh, as before I will just highlight a couple that resonate with me. Um, you talk about passion and enthusiasm. The other thing which for me is sort of linked to that, well, I think we're using the same word, uh, different words for the same quality. If you think about what we're all dealing with at the moment, it would be very easy to think, oh my goodness me, I'm just going to build a hut at the bottom of the garden and do whatever is my favorite solitary pastime. When you're running a company or a team or a department or a division or the BBC, um, 
you want people with what I call energy. And the favorite remark that senior managers will have to their teams is don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. So when you're employing somebody at any level, what your antennae are looking for is, is this somebody I can share the responsibility with? I want somebody who I can rely on. I want somebody who, when everything's gone wrong, is still just about smiling. I mean, you know, we, and I think, I don't know about you, but I mean, if I just talked to the, all of you as a human being, in the last 15 months, I have made a conscious effort to avoid moaners. I just can't be doing with it. I can keep myself going, but I want to work with people who are making an effort to be cheerful. And actually it's one of the things that this last 15 months has really highlighted. So going back to this passion point is, uh, it's, I think it's even more subtle than passion. I mean, it is enthusiasm for the brand, the activity, the craft, but I want people with grit as well, actually. And I think that um, in terms of when you're looking for examples that you can tell about yourself, what's really useful, really powerful in interviews is to talk about a problem you faced and how you solved it. And it could be something like, I used to do such and such a job, but the trouble was um, that I always had to get up at six o'clock. And I can tell you, it took me a month, three months, I don't know. I'm just using this as, a, I'm making it up, but you'll see what I mean, is tell a story about how you overcame a problem um, it's, it can be really good rather than just saying, I did a bloody brilliant job. Yeah. Um, and I think that I'm just looking at the clock. We said half an hour. We've sort of been going for half an hour. And I'm now going to ask everybody on this call. Um, and Vicky, it sort of includes you is... I would love people to have the chance to say, of the things I heard, could you explain or tell me a bit more about something? I'm very happy to go for another 10 minutes, but equally, um, everybody has got lots of other things to do. So I'm sort of going to, I'm not looking at Vicky now, I'm looking at everybody who so far hasn't really had a chance to say anything. Are there any questions that, you would like to put to Vicky and me now? Has anybody got anything? Or did we do such a brilliant job that you haven't? And by the way, tell me, are any of you coming to the workshop next week? Isabel's nodding. Claire's nodding. Uh, Alan, is that a nod from you? Sorry, I've had to mute myself while my dog drinks and just... <laughs> oh, right. Okay, so I'm getting yeses. You see, this is what I mean about not being not very good at this. Connor? Oh, yeah, just, I'm yes, here. so Amanda's... I'm getting yeses. This makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the chat, we're getting lots of yeses. Amanda, Justin. Yeah, thank God, Justin. There we are. Daniel Shields as well. Yeah. <laughs> does, any, does anybody have any questions that they want to put in the chat if they don't want to ask them out? Um, or if you want to yep. put your hand. Happy to carry on. Brilliant. Well, in that case, I think that um, what I've been trying to do with Vicky's help, because Vicky is the practice, she is the voice of the ex being on the other side of the desk. This is really important. I can talk about the theory. We've given you lots of specific examples and ideas um, so it would be good to hear from anybody and everybody, either on the chat thingy or speaking. Um, what ideas have sort of jumped out at you as being, oh, that's a good idea, or 
I hadn't thought about that. And by the way, is there something you want to, us to comment on? And by the way, I'm going to sort of put the pressure on all of you, which is to say, even when you ask a question, remember that it's not just you asking the question, but it's probably the same question that lots of other people have, and you could help them by asking it for them. So who wants to lead the charge? Isabel. Uh, I have... Sorry, yes. I have two things. So the first one is about the two questions uh, that we could plan on structuring at the end for the interview because they normally ask us. It's how would we even start on structuring these questions because I, I have barely any experiences in interviews. So, and the second question is tips to avoid feeling imposter syndrome, which happens quite a lot during interviews. Okay. Right. Well, um, what I suggest is that um, Vicky and I between us will repl reply. Um, in terms of um, questions, it, it, um, I think that my first thought would be this, that is, if you think about the research point, um, whatever you can find out about the organization is a good idea. But then I would suggest, that, and then see, I, I, I will come up with my first thought and then we'll see where, what Vicky thinks mm -hmm. is, once upon a time, John F. Kennedy, when he was the president of the United States, said to everybody, don't think about what America can do for you, think about what you can do for America. Now, my suggestion would be, just to give you something to sort of work with, is to say, look at the company and think about two or three things about the company that you would genuinely like to know more about. I mean, don't make it up. And Vicky's point about people can always tell if you're being genuine. Never, never, never do something because you think it might get you a brownie point. You've got to be gen genuinely interested and curious. So your first set of questions will be about what the company is and it might be you know if you were meeting Vicky you'd say you've got this fantastic track record what keeps you awake at night or what do you want to do next yeah because when you're ve very successful if you're Vicky one of the difficult things is you've got to keep reaching for the next thing so there's that stuff but then I think the other set of questions Isabel is about Think about things that you are important to you and ask in terms of, you could say to Vicky, look, one of the genres that I'm really interested in is this. Does this have a place in your future plans? So it's this thing of what do you need to know more about the company about? Because you are interested in where it's going and then what is it about yourself that you would really like to do so if you you know if you want to travel if there's a particular genre um you might want to ask something like um you know how much training on the job do i get yeah definitely now those are just examples vicky over to you yeah, no, definitely. I think, you know, if you're going to start, I always say come up with two questions. And as, as Sheila said, one for me is it should be specific to you or to the role that you're applying for. Um, but just to give you an example of some questions I've been asked in the past that have stuck with me and that I loved um, yeah. were I had two questions. One was, um, what is it you love about working in Stellify? So, you know, that, I thought that was a great question. Another one was yeah. what has been your greatest achievement while working at Stellify. Yeah. So for me, those two questions were brilliant because it instantly turned it around and I became the interviewee. Yeah. <laughs> I had to think of something, which I thought was great. That, that Those were two fantastic questions. So I always think, you know, try and make your question. One question should be, you know, um, say, for instance, it's a researcher role. 
you should say, you know, you know, while I'm working as a researcher, will I, you know, will the role have opportunities to possibly work in development, or you know, is there room for the role to grow? So that's a question specific to the role. Um, and then likewise, another question, think about, you know, you could, you could even ask something like if you're going to, like, again, a production company, you could say, you know, of all the shows you've made, what has been your most favorite show to work on and what has been your least favorite show to work on? You know, so and I don't think just it, it gives the interviewers, a, you know, a chance to kind of be put under the microscope, but it also gives us, it shows us that you're taking a really in, an interest in yeah. funny and it just, it makes you stand out. So that's definitely how I would structure the two questions. And then I'm just going to jump in quickly with your, your imposter yep. syndrome, um, question and answer that in that I've been interviewing and inter being an interviewee and an interviewer for over 20 years. Um, and I do a lot of, you know, face-to-face -face workshops and a lot of, I've done a lot of talks to, you know, 40 plus, 50 plus, up to 200 people. I've never lost my imposter syndrome. <laughs> and I talk wow. all the time to the, yeah. the two yeah. MDs, Karen and Matt, and they're both the same, you know, I don't, it's, you can work on it and work on it, but I think yeah. the minute you lose your imposter syndrome, I think you become stagnant, mm -hmm. so, you know, yeah. you should, I never take for granted where yeah. I am in my career, um, and that's what drives me. So yeah. yes, if it makes you feel any better, I've been at this quite a long time and I still have imposter syndrome. <laughs> so I don't know, Sheila, if you can give us some words of wisdom on that one. Well, um, uh, I echo 100% and uh, in the spirit of preparation I can tell you even though I've done these sort of conversations with groups of people for 26 years now um, I spent 45 minutes preparing for today just to make sure I was in the right place I was talking aloud I wanted to make sure that my camera was set up in the right place um, uh, now, all of that is to say, uh, and I agree with Vicky 100%, is if the adrenaline is not running, if the fear, good old fashioned fear, you need to feel on the edge. And when people say to me, you know, uh, I want to manage it, I always tell the story of Laurence Olivier you know, one of the most successful actors. And apparently he vomited every single night before he went on stage. And it was just, you know, it was just him get, getting in. Now, we definitely don't want you being as extremely stressed as that. But I think what the two of us are saying is actually adrenaline or a, a, a bit of fear is good. Absolutely. Uh, and then there was one other thing I would wanted to throw into this about sort of developing questions and a general point I wanted to make today is that because an interview is talking aloud rather than writing things is talk to yourself. But I think a really helpful thing to do is to get yourself a buddy and you know, it could even be somebody on this call that two of you say, look, you know, I saw you on the call. We know each other. Or we, you might say, look, I'm, you and I have never met before, but I saw you on the call. Um, why don't we, for the next three months, just support each other? Mm -hmm. And so coming back to something like questions, you know, if you just put your heads together and say, have you got any questions? No, but I've got a couple. And then you just brainstorm them for half an hour and come up with the best possible set of questions. Doing it on your own is quite hard. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always, when I was younger and I was practicing for, you know, working up towards an interview, I would have always run through an interview with, with my best friend. I would have got her to pretend to be the interviewer. Um, and it's, um, you know, it, it was like a bit of a comedy sketch at times. You know, she would ask me just really, really stupid, hard questions. And I'd be like, oh, but, you know, it, it just helps you kind of run through it in your head. And it goes back to that point I said earlier on about, you know, creating those stories that you tell. It helps you just practice those stories. So then those stories just get etched in your brain and you can pull them out at any time then. Um, so, yeah, I'm just, I'm reading through. I'm sure I say you are as well. I'm just reading through some of the questions. Yeah, I'm, uh, 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 I'm ashamed to say I've only just twigged how this works. Please bear with me. Um, uh, I can jump in so and answer. 
So shall I go, shall we go through them in the order they came in? Is that the right way yeah. to do it? Perfect. So Alan, uh, you, you came in interested in approaches to avoid over-preparedness. It's a, again, really good question. Um, Vicky, do you want to start with that one? Yes, um, I think in terms of being over-prepared, it, it's, it's almost like you create a script for yourself. For me, that's what it'll be an over-prepared is if you over-prepare, you well, a script and you know, you're, you're basically going to read it word for word. And that comes yeah. across in an interview. You know, if you have lit and sometimes also when you over-prepare, you can become very wooden. As Sheila said earlier on, spontaneity is a massive key for interviewing and for this process as well. I mean, I literally have just written some notes down before, before I joined the call of things that I was going to say, because if I personally, if I think about it and over and write stuff down for the weeks leading up to it, when it gets to the actual event itself or the interview, I'll have forgotten it all. You know, so I think you have to allow a certain amount of spontaneity because that's when your personality comes through. Um, but yeah, yeah I definitely say don't create a script for yourself. That's what I meant by being over-prepared. Um, and don't run through it so much in your head that the minute you sit down, your head goes blank. Yeah. And, and your point about personality coming through, that's the thing we're going to be focusing on very much next week. Mm -hmm. um, but just, Alan, to sort of give you um, uh, my uh, comments on that point is that one of the things I encourage people to do is that once you've, once you've worked out some of the points you want to make, and particularly when it comes to telling stories, um, uh, is if I borrow the point about don't have the, the script of the story, have what the key points were. Um, and uh, uh, if you've only got points, you might have three or four points or you might have five points. And do you know what? If you even only remember three of them, it's fine. Um, but it is this thing of, it's, it's quite a big thing to, uh, I, uh, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail now because that's not what this sort of call is about. But I think the way to think about it is you have your points ready, but Vicky's point about reading the room and what the other person's interested in is what you've got to do. And it's marrying the points with what they're interested in. And the trouble with being overprepared and scripted is that you don't dare leave the script. Mm -hmm. And actually, as you're talking, what we do normally is you're looking for the verbal cues and you can do that on Zoom. Um, uh, and you can tell very quickly whether a point is something that's interesting and then you can stop and color it or if it's less interesting then you move on to the next one yeah. and over preparedness means you're going to make every single bloody point whether they're interested in it or not you're just going to go in there and exactly and can them. i also add to that as well you know um yeah. another thing is don't try to don't try to figure out, don't try to, to, to think ahead of what you're going to be asked and work out your answers. Yes, you know, you, you will wonder, you know, I'm going, oh, I might be asked about this, I might be asked about this, but don't try to prepare answers for all of the questions that you think you're going to be asked because if you get into the room and you're not asked a single one of those questions, you're going to panic. So again, it, it's that's another way of being overprepared is, you know, trying to, um, trying to think ahead and figure out what they're going to ask you and then only have answers to those questions. So it's, it, they have, you have to allow a certain amount of spontaneity in an interview, definitely. And by the way, I think what you can also pick up from the sort of things that we're covering is this point about practice. And, you know, I mean, again, I'm sort of slightly racing ahead. I'm really bad at that in everything I do. But it could be that at the end of next week, you actually you know, I talked about buddies, but I mean, maybe even you do sort of mock interviews with each other and you can, you know, one of you can be the interview, one of you can pretend to be Vicky and you can decide this is the job I have to offer. 
and then you can sort of mock interview a couple of people. And I can tell you, it's great fun being a really bloody minded Vicky and then giving the, giving the other person a hard time. Um, <laughs> it is guess, great fun. Um, so, I, oh. Sorry, I, I'll go on. It's, I guess I, I'm here as a bit of a cheat. So I, I'm the associate head of school for communication and media at Ulster. And what we tried to do is build some assessments for students around interviews and right. that kind of stuff. So we would give them like a list of 10 questions that, that are kind of standard interview questions. You know, when have you worked well in a group? And they do that, that practice thing in classes, backwards and forwards with the interviews. And then they are assessed and we, we pull out three questions. So they've got like 10 that they might be asked and then we ask them three at random. And then we give them two scenario work-based ones, which are kind of Excellent, yeah. out of the blue. So like, you know, you're in a meeting with Vicky and you've told her your ideas and she pitches them all and claims that they're hers. What do you do after the meeting? How do you tackle that kind of stuff? Um, so I'm here for the top tips. That's why I was interested in the over-preparedness because uh, I'll feed that back into our students. It was one of the things Good. that we brought into the courses because students didn't get a lot of that stuff. Like, how do you know how to interview until you've interviewed? Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Brilliant. Um, uh, I'm uh, just whizzing down the questions. Um, Cleona, you said, when it comes to researching a company, what sort of things should we look into? I'm not even sure where to start. Vicky, that's definitely one for you. Yes. So um, I would say when you're researching a company, Google is your friend. So, you know, when you're researching, I would find a website. Every company has a website. Some are better than others, obviously. But you can generally find out, I mean, if it's the, if it's the TV industry, if it's like, for instance, if it's Delphi, you would go on to your website and you would find out, first of all, what content we're creating. Who are the key players in the company? There's usually always a staff page. So, you know, you should know who's interviewing you by that stage. So I would always go on because most of websites, again, they'll have a staff page and they'll have little bios. So read about the staff who are interviewing you, read about the key staff in the company and, um, you know, check out the positions that they currently employ. Uh, and then it's a case of, you know, by doing a, a Google search of those people, you can find out what other things those people are doing. For instance, you know, if you were Google searching me, you'd see that I'm also, you know, I've being chair of the RTS, I'm, I'm a member of the RTS, I'm on BMF, you know, you would see I'm involved in a lot of different things. Um, so then you start to build a picture of the person who's interviewing you and they become less scary as well. They become a person, yeah. which is great, you know, um, and then it gives you ideas of things to say whenever you get into the room. But in terms of research and a company you want to work for, if it's, again, I'm applying this to TV because that's the general kind of area that most people are interested in on here. Um, you know, if you're interested in making documentaries, you'll know very quickly from looking at the company website or looking at the content they're creating, is that the right company for you? You know, or is it more entertainment led? You know, is it more factual? So that's what I mean by research and definitely the internet, Google is your friend. And um, you know, if you have contacts in the industry, great chat to them. But I would say that's the best place to start is figure out the content they're doing. Is it something you like? Again, you could end up, I mean, I get a lot of people who interview for me and they'll say, you know, it wasn't until I went on the website that I realized that you made such and such a show. Oh, I love that show. Um, and they wouldn't have known that we did that. So once they've gone, so I would say, you know, go on, see what they're making. And you probably find actually the companies are making a lot more stuff than you realize. So that, that's what I would mean to you about what I would mean when I would say research the company, know who, know the company, but people in the company too. And um, so, yes, I think I pass back to you, Sheila. <laughs> well, and I'm going to finish up with one last question, which is a really good one um, for everybody still on the call. Um, and that is, and it's the last one that we haven't covered. Uh, it's Daniels. If the, uh, when there's a drought in terms of recruitment, what is the best way to get on someone's radar mm -hmm. so that when opportunities for an interview come up, you've got a, you're already sort of in people's on people's radar. Um, Vicky, could you kick off with that? Yes. So again, um, I think the, the more you can kind of get in front of people, but obviously the last year has been really difficult because we haven't been able to network. When you can, when we can network, networking is a perfect opportunity. Find out what events are being run. And, and again, you know, 
media therapy runs events, there's RTS events. You don't realize how many influential people are on those events or on calls. And just by asking the question or putting yourself forward, you're getting people's radars. You know, I attend BMF every year and I meet students there that really impress me and they literally have a small window, but it's the ones who will come up to me and talk to me. So don't be afraid to email or call, you know, and find out the people in the, you know, do your Google search, find out the person who is in the department that you want to work in. Don't be afraid to drop them an email. And actually one of the best emails I ever got, um, and it was a cold email came in from a student. She had literally um, written an email. Sorry, my dog. Ah! <laughs> She'd written the email um, and she was selling herself like a TV show. So she had, um, she'd, put, she'd basically structured the whole email like she was a TV show that she was trying to present to me. And it was so impressive that I shared it with the whole company and then she went on to work for us. So it goes to show you that, you know, being creative, <laughs> sorry. Being creative, <laughs> the the dog is a bit like the egg timer yeah. saying, you know, um, so I will time. just... I will just follow up on Vicky's and then and, and, and then we'll stop and pick up next week is, you know, I was saying a little while ago, I made this point about energy. And actually what Vic is describing is it's another word is tenacity. Um, and by the way, uh, Daniel, this is definitely not about selling yourself. It's about being genuinely curious and wanting to get to know the other people more. It's not about me, me, me. I mean, uh, so, the, so the person who decided to email themselves as a program was thinking about how can I grab the attention of somebody who is very busy? How can I stand out? How can I get my personality, my joie de vivre, my energy, my enthusiasm, my passion, how can I get it across? And that's what we'll pick up on next week. Um, well, from my point of view, because remember, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I am brand new to the world of RTS in Northern Ireland. Um, so thank you everybody who's still on the call uh, for such a lovely, and and making it an hour because it allows us to do more. Um, and uh, I'm absolutely thrilled that we've got a second one in the bag for next week. <laughs>